talk about the uh, dry port logistics infrastructure development, we talk about the economic value of integrated supply chain. Uh, Mamon studies at the University of Toronto and then had the misfortune of being my student. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> he's Rashad's son, what do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> okay, but even Rashad didn't expect me to end up with him. In fact, he's going to talk about the, our students are supposed to do a capstone project at the end of their master's degree, and this is the topic that Mamun chose to do in his uh, capstone project, and he's going to talk about it today. So, Mamun. So good afternoon. Actually, this isn't my topic. Whoever gave me the paper or the topic is slightly wrong, but I have it. I'll go into it. Um, and I was not supposed to be the one to the session. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's okay. Okay. <laughs> so it works. <laughs> Who's behind it all? <laughs> hey, so good afternoon. Um, throughout the day, we've been hearing talks about industry best practices. Uh, today, mainly the, the talks were concentrating on the infrastructure, on the logistics infrastructure. And tomorrow, we'll hear more talks on uh, technologies that will enable the supply chain or uh, create more efficiency in the logistics chain. What I'm here to talk about is how do we go about assessing the impact of all the different policies and investments on the transportation chain as a whole. And what I mean, uh, what I mean by that is uh, different practices around the world might be good for a specific country or a specific area, and doesn't necessarily mean that they can be applied here in Jordan or and vice versa. Uh, so this. Uh, was done by myself uh, and Rini, who's uh, next to me, along with uh, under the supervision of our advisors, uh, Dr. Chris Nahui and Dr. Nima. We are currently working on uh, publishing uh, this paper in the academic journal. So, our objective was to use systems thinking, and this is what made it uh, unique, I'd say, uh, to develop a framework that assesses the impact of policies and investment decisions on the inland transportation chain. What I mean by the inland transportation chain here is uh, the movement from the port, or I'll be concentrating on the container terminal, to destination and back. Uh, so this is what my talk will be will look like. I'll start off with some high-level industry backgrounds. Uh, some, most of them you've heard by now. Then take Jordan as a case study to set the foundations of uh, the, the model we built or the framework. And then I'll go into the, the high-level uh, framework, what it looks like, and uh, then present uh, the simulation model where the fun parts, where the fun part actually is, um, and we ran a few simulations. And that should be interesting to see. Uh, so, uh, so, some, so we know container terminals play a vital role in global trade. And I think we can all agree that without the functioning of uh, seaports, the global economy would be very different. Uh, so some industry trends we see, uh, we're seeing mega ships and alliances, uh, vertical integrations with the hinterlands or dry ports, uh, technology, uh, we're hearing more and more about uh, blockchain these days. Yeah. So moving cargo from one place to another uh, requires a lot of interactions with uh, different parties and these interactions uh, create complexities so uh, if you are to improve one part of uh, let's say you're in, you want to improve uh, custom clearance without taking the trucking into account then you might not get the desired outcome you wanted and uh, moving on to Jordan so Jordan is an import dependent country as most of us know 75% uh, of containerized trade are in import are imports, and uh, we've seen a growth in, uh, in containerized trade in the past 10 years. Uh, the access point is Aqaba, and it's our only access point, and this is why I believe we need to have an efficient uh, 
chain from Aqaba onwards. Uh, the main mode of transport inland is trucks, uh, so there's no rail. Um, so, just a high level, uh, we've seen some uh, positive growth in annual throughput uh, from the years of 2007 up to 2013. And then from there, it slightly dropped uh, until it slightly dropped and oscillated at a certain level. And this is due to the, uh, let's say, the closure of the borders uh, in the countries next to us in Iraq. So actually in 2012, um, the share of in-transit cargo was 25% of imports. And imports represented six times uh, exports. And then in 2017, the in-transit cargo represented 2% of uh, the import volumes. But exports grew and imports were like three times uh, the, uh, the volume of exports. So the geopolitical situation affects are affecting our uh, containerized trade or all, all kinds of trade. And you've heard this uh, twice today, so I won't be repeating this again and again. But in 2016, when we did the study, uh, the, or in 2017, we used the 2016 number. Uh, Jordan's ranking in MPI or the Logistics Performance Index was 67. And uh, in 2018, it's ranked 84. Dropping 17 uh, ranking points, uh, which hurt. Uh, I guess those are some reasons uh, for improving Jordan's transportation chain. So the regional shifts or geopolitical situation are impacting our containerized trade. So we, we need something that's resilient. Um, and then we only have one access point to the sea. And um, Jordan has the potential to act as a hub for the region, as it, as, as it has in the past, especially for Iraq, within transit cargo movement. And with, the Jordan, with Jordan's LPI rankings low and getting worse, I think uh, this could also, this is another reason why we, uh, we need to improve our logistics chain. Uh, so some initiatives we hear about, there's uh, the reduction of dwell time by reducing documentation process and time, maybe by technology or by improving the process. Then we hear about talks uh, of the establishment of dry port outside of Aqaba. And then maybe a rail project, uh, who knows. So moving on to the framework. Uh, we use what's called system dynamics. And uh, this is a study of a complex uh, to study and manage uh, complex feedback systems. Um, and uh, basically, it allows the decision makers and policy makers to, to eliminate unwanted patterns by understanding uh, the system and the feedback loops within it. Uh, uh, I'll explain that. So this is what the general high-level framework uh, looked like. So we first started off by mapping the process. Uh, we map the process by talking to stakeholders, I didn't, uh, identifying them first, talking to the stakeholders, and then building this conceptual model where we um, identify the relationships uh, just mentally. What would happen if uh, container levels go up? Uh, how would that affect some other variable in this part of the system? And then we built the simulation model um, and ran a few uh, scenarios or a few alternatives. We chose a few alternatives and uh, yeah, testing them out under different scenarios. Uh, so the import process here, or I guess elsewhere as well, relies really on four main pillars. Uh, you have the information flow, you have the documentation flow, the financial flow, and finally the cargo flow. This is basically what the cargo flow looks like. Um, everything else happens in the background in terms of, let's say, the information flow, like uh, from the ship agents to notify uh, consignees or the documentation flow from customs to ship agents, or from ship agents to customs to uh, customs for uh, clearance uh, agents. And the financial flows are the transactions, uh, transactions that go on, the financial transactions. So this was a simple way to map the relationships between some variables in the system. So we have the volume of container, the import container volumes are 
have gone off substantially less, while everything else was kept constant. What does that mean? It mean, it mean what does that mean for the yard, for the container terminal yard? The yard utilization would go up. As the yard utilization continues to fill, then we need more moves in the terminal yard, so that reduces the terminal's productivity. Reducing the terminal productivity would increase the dwell time. And then ultimately increasing the total landed cost, uh, reducing aquifer's competitiveness, and then finally reducing uh, the import uh, volumes. So that's like a balancing feedback loop. And then we did the same for other variables, and finally ended up with something that looks uh, like this. This is just a conceptual model. Uh, but this is where the fun part started, or starts. Uh, before building the model, we've made a few assumptions to simplify simplify it. So one of the biggest flaws, we've assumed that there's only one size and type of container, one size and type of trailer. And the terminal productivity is always at 100% unless uh, the yard gets fully congested. Um, and a bunch of other assumptions that were made just to simplify things. So here's what uh, let's call it the model's backbone look like. We've identified six main elements. Uh, four of them are the so-called subsystems, and they are limited by uh, two main constraints. So we have the key side subsystem, let's call it. We have the documentation processing, uh, the export booking, or the rate at which uh, we receive exports. And then we have the main inland transportation chain, which is from the port, the imports, uh, the containers arriving at the terminal yard, and then to the destination and back. And those are constrained by, uh, we've assumed for now, just two uh, constraints, we have the terminal yard and the fleet size. Then we mapped uh, the relationships between them. Now what the actual model looked like, uh, so this is the key site subsystem. Um, we have a rate of ship arrivals um, and then a sailing rate or an outflow. And those boxes in between are the, they call them, the, this is the stock and flow model. And so you have the rate and then the boxes are the accumulation of the, the units that we're trying to measure here. This is the, so this is the key site subsystem, the documentation processing, uh, export booking. This is the inland transportation chain, and we've created this uh, little uh, binary variable called uh, containers, or sorry, a dry port. So if we wanted to test out a dry port, then we just change this to one, and it routes the, let's say, imported to the arrived, uh, the arrived containers directly to the dry ports. And then the limitations. Putting it all together, it looks something like this. And each um, variable in there, I know it's not very clear, but each variable in there has a small formula that links it to one another and basically makes this uh, simulation work. So, Moving on to some examples uh, we tested out. Sorry, Mahmoud. Yes. The simulation is for Aqaba? Yes. Okay. So it was based on it was based on the import process that I showed you earlier. Yes. Um, yeah. And like the same the same let's say methodology or, or thinking can be applied to elsewhere or the general cargo. Here's what the simulation setup looked like. Um, we first said, okay, well, let's identify some policies. So we started with, you have the status quo, or the do nothing. Then there's an invest in a dry port, invest in technology, and then maybe a combination of both. So our first run, or let's call it our, yeah, first runs were for a short time period with one ship arrival. And the, the reason is just to show, uh, to be able to show, to pinpoint the number of how the containers are flowing. Because if you have a daily ship arrival, then you wouldn't be able to pinpoint, um, you'll see now the container turnaround. Then we've identified uh, a few scenarios to test it out. Because what's a, a good policy really is, is only good until it's tested out in, uh, in a harsh environment. Let's say. Uh, so the scenario is where we have the base case where nothing special happens. Then we have a limitation in the yard capacity. Um, a limitation in trucking capacity, a limitation in documentation capacity. And those limitations might be limitations because of the uh, a shock in the supply, maybe a, a trucker strike, uh, an earthquake or what 
whatever, um, or a surge in demand, maybe the opening of the border, suddenly we see massive amounts of uh, ships and containers that are discharging at the border. And those were measured against uh, four KPIs we defined. The first being the container turnaround, which is the number of days of it takes to from discharging at the terminal and then uh, delivery and bringing it back empty or full. And then you have the delivery time, which is the number of days it takes to deliver from the terminal to the, the, the final destination, the trailers turn around, and the container acceptance. And the, by container acceptance, uh, what we mean here is, are we able to accept all the containers uh, that have been that are on, on a ship? So, um, here are some parameters. Um, so this, this is for a hypothetical terminal. Uh, the, the, the simulation runs I'm about to show you are for a hypothetical terminal and does not represent Aqaba or reality. Uh, the aim here is just to showcase how the model works. Uh, so we've only changed like one or two uh, variables uh, in each. And then for the scenarios, uh, as you see for the limitation in the yard capacity, we brought it down by 98%. For the limitation in trucking, we brought it down by 88%. And limitation in documentation, we brought it down uh, by 78%, just to test it out to see what would happen if uh, things blow up. So here's what, this is what the container turnaround graph looks like under, let's say, the, under the base scenario. So it starts off, those are the, the four main policies, let's call them, or alternatives. Uh, once the ship arrives, it discharges immediately. So that's day one. You see the high, it, it, it peaks on day one. And then as custom clearance, uh, the containers are custom cleared and starts to, delivery takes place. Uh, the, both are, this graph shows the containers that are in the yard. As containers get picked up, uh, the number of containers go down. And then they go back up when the entry return is back. So as you see for the, the combo option and the dry port, or the ones that had the dry port, uh, they, they were immediately, uh, they immediately get gated out. And the reason is uh, they're doing custom clearance at elsewhere at uh, dry port. Uh, yeah, but then uh, as you see here, if, if for instance we just take things through the dry port, uh, but you don't implement, uh, for instance, uh, they take the same amount of time to deliver to the final destination, then really it's the same, it's the same number of days it took uh, as the status quo, uh, as the status quo. So in this, in this scenario, or in this run, uh, the tech and the combo achieve the same, uh, let's say, number of days, number of uh, turnaround days. This is what the trailer's utilization graph looked like. Again, uh, so for the dry ports option, since we only assume that the mode of transport is by trucks, um, moving things from the terminal to the dry port requires trucks, and then from the dry port to destination and back requires trucks, and we have a limited fleet of trucks. So what this means is we're putting more pressure on the trucks. So the status quo and the tech investment actually did better on these uh, in terms of the trailer's utilization. And then for delivery time, uh, the combo option and the, uh, the combo alternative and the tech uh, reduced the number of days of delivery time days from 13 down to seven. So basically the combo achieved the highest rank under the base scenario. Now we move on to the other scenarios when the terminal capacity is limited, let's say here, I think it was around uh, 600, 600 something. It, uh, some, the capacity was, sorry, around, yeah, 600. And we had around 1,000 containers that are being discharged. So uh, some, ter some containers had to be rejected by the terminal. We couldn't accept them all. And in this case, uh, the combo option did the best. The, the combo and the dry port actually, uh, we're able to accommodate more containers. And what this means is to have a resilient system, to have a more, let's say, the dry ports are good uh, when you expect uh, 
a surge in demand. Uh, so your capacity could be limited at some point in time. And then we did the same, uh, but limited the fleet size. And interestingly, the tech achieved the highest rank. Uh, just improving the documentation processing uh, achieved a higher rank than implementing a dry port. And the reason was because we don't have sufficient trucks. And then we did the same thing with documentation. Let's say we had a limitation on the number of people at customs or at shipping agencies or custom clearance. Um, and under this scenario, the combo option got the highest ranking. So it's not a surprise that uh, the combo option of uh, the uh, dry port and tech got the highest ranking, right? Uh, but here's where it gets interesting. So we said, okay, uh, let's run this again, but in a longer uh, time period, a time period of one year. And uh, it took me by surprise, actually. So we ran it. What was going on um, was that the, uh, the containers arrived and then they had to be pushed out of the terminal by trucks to the <coughs> port. And then after a number of days, they would be uh, picked up and uh, dropped off come back, circle back to the port. And with time, the containers in the yard kept accumulating because the trucks weren't able to keep up. They were accumulating up to a certain point. In, in the simulation world, it was at day 275, uh, where there was a big massive crisis. And the container terminal yard was completely clogged that trailers coming back in with empties couldn't go in, and then the ships couldn't discharge and they couldn't load because we made an assumption that to uh, load cargo or load exports, you need to discharge first since it's, it's an import-dependent country. So it, it, ships accumulated at the quayside or at, at, at sea, and you had a big queue of trucks, and the terminal in the yard was completely clogged. And I found that interesting uh, because it took me by surprise, uh, really. And then we said, okay, let's increase the fleet size uh, from 4,000. Let's just try to increase it to 5,000 and see what happens. And it actually worked. Uh, the containers in the terminal yard were at 4% of the of utilization than what it was in the, in the previous uh, scenario. And we got a more desirable outcome than the status quo. So in the previous scenario, when we just improved, when we just implemented the dry port and the, the tech or the documentation processing time, Without taking trucking into account, we actually had a worse effect in the long term. Uh, yeah, so we're almost there. Uh, so moving forward, I think there's a lot of uses like to, to a model like this. Uh, of course, it, it still needs uh, a few things uh, to to bring it to practice. Uh, we need to run the model with real data, as in uh, real data from here, like customs and the time it takes to clear uh, transportation data. Um, and as many of you know, uh, a, lot, a lot of these data are this, uh, decentralized say, and not accessible to us. So that was uh, a major challenge uh, that a lot of assumptions were made. And then we can relax certain assumptions to gain more insights. And then the biggest is to factor in financial implications because maybe you know, this, uh, this model only uh, factored in time. And uh, we know sometimes time, maybe there's a big investment. And uh, yeah, they might not, they would collide. So it, it could be that the documentation processing would be much better than implementing a dry port. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Uh, and then in the end, uh, this is just a supportive tool. And us humans need to make the final, the final decision. I guess the, the conclusion here is just we need to look beyond the seaport. And take a holistic uh, take a holistic view, in looking at it as a whole system, and understand the the elements that exist uh, in the system and, and how they and identify the, those feedback loops. Uh, so, yeah, it, it also helps us uh, evaluate the current uh, transport chain under different scenarios, and would ultimately uh, encourage a proactive approach in planning. And uh, yeah, with this, I'd like to conclude uh, the presentation and open the floor for questions and comments.
Thank you very much, Ramon. Uh, but our next speaker also has a connection to MIT. It's uh, Sheldon Fink. His son, Joel, is a colleague of mine at MIT. He's a professor at MIT, too. So we all have you know, a big connection here. Sheldon himself is a graduate of Harvard Law School, of the other school you know, up the river from MIT, which we really don't mention. <laughs> um, he was a legal advisor to an oil tanking company who so has background in logistics. And he was CEO of a, a listed manufacturing company before working on water desalination, electrical generation, oil exploration plants, a project in Turkey, Israel, Jordan in the 90s. In 2003, he became a partner and served as CEO of BBI Aqaba Industrial Estate Group. And in parallel, he's engaged, he's a busy guy, in parallel, he's engaged with developing geothermal energy project in Turkey and developing transportation, power generation, solar energy, and LED lighting project in Jordan and Turkey. So with this, let me invite Sheldon 